welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of The History of Magic Including a clear and precise exposition of its procedure, its rites, and its mysteries By Eliphas Levi 1922 Preface to the English Translation In several casual references scattered through periodical literature, in the biographical sketch which preceded my rendering of Dogme et Ritual de la Haute Meiji and elsewhere, as occasion prompted, I have put on record an opinion that the history of magic, by Alphonse Louis Constant, written, like the majority of his works, under the pseudonym of Eliphas Levi, is the most arresting entertaining and brilliant of all studies on the subject with which I am acquainted. So far back as 1896 I said that it was admirable as a philosophical survey, its historical inaccuracies notwithstanding, and that there is nothing in occult literature which can suffer comparison therewith. Moreover, there is nothing so comprehensive in the French language, while as regards ourselves it must be said that, outside records of research on the part of folklore scholarship, we have depended so far on a history by Joseph Ennemoser, translated from the German and explaining everything, within the domain included under the denomination of magic, by the phenomena of animal magnetism. Other texts than this are available in that language, but they have not been put into English, while none of them has so great an appeal as that which is here rendered into our tongue. Having certified so far regarding its titles, it is perhaps desirable to add, from my own standpoint, that I have not translated the book merely because it is entertaining and brilliant, or because it will afford those who are concerned with magic in history a serviceable general account. The task has been undertaken still less in the interests of any who may have other, that is to say, direct occult, reasons for acquaintance with its procedure, its rites and its mysteries. I have no object in providing unwary and foolish seekers with material of this kind, and it so happens that the present history does not fulfill the promise of its subtitle in these respects, or at least to any extent that they would term practical in their folly. Through all my later literary life I have sought to make it plain, as the result of antecedent years spent in occult research, that the occult sciences, in all their general understanding, are paths of danger when they are not paths of simple make-believe and imposture. The importance of Eliphas Levi's account at large of the claims, and of their story throughout the centuries, arises from the fact, a, that he is the authoritative exponent-in-chief of all the alleged sciences, b, that it is he who, in a sense, restored and placed them, under a new and more attractive vesture, before public notice at the middle period of the nineteenth century, c, that he claimed, as we shall see, the very fullest knowledge concerning them, being that of an adept and master. But, d, that, subject to one qualification, the worth of which will be mentioned, it follows from his long examination that magic, as understood not in the streets only but in the houses of research concerning it, has no ground in the truth of things, and is of the region of delusion only. It is for this reason that I have translated his history of magic, as one who reckons a not too gracious task for something which leans toward righteousness, at least in the sense of charity. The world is full at this day of the false claims which arise out of that region, and I have better reasons than most even of my readers can imagine to undeceive those who, having been drawn in such directions, may be still saved from deception. It is well therefore that out of the mouth of a master we can draw the fullest evidence required for this purpose. In the present prefatory words I propose to shew, firstly, the nature of Eliphas Levi's personal claims, so that there may be no misconception as to what they were actually, and as to the kind of voice which is speaking, secondly, his original statement of the claims, nature and value of transcendental magic, and, thirdly, his later evidences on its phenomenal or so-called practical side, 
as established by its own history. In this manner we shall obtain his canon of criticism, and I regard it as valuable, because, with all his imperfections, he had better titles of knowledge at his own day than any one, while it cannot be said that his place has been filled since, though many workers have risen up in the same field of inquiry and have specialized in the numerous departments which he covered generally and superficially. Before entering upon these matters it may be thought that I should speak at some length of the author's life, but the outlines have been given already in an extended introduction prefixed to a digest of his writings which I published many years ago under the title of Mysteries of Magic, and again, but from another point of view, in the preface to the doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic already mentioned. The latter will be made available shortly in a new annotated edition. For the rest, an authoritative life of Eliphaz Levi has been promised for years in France, but is still delayed, and in its absence the salient biographical facts are not numerous, in the present place it will be therefore sufficient to say that Alphonse Louis Constant was born at Paris in 1810, and was the son of a shoemaker, apparently in very poor circumstances. His precocity in childhood seemed to give some promise of future ability, he was brought to the notice of a priest belonging to his parish, and this in its turn led to his gratuitous education at St. Sulpice, obviously with a view to the priesthood. There his superiors must have recognized sufficient traces of vocation, according to the measures of the particular place and period, for he proceeded to minor orders and subsequently became a deacon. He seems, however, to have conceived strange views on doctrinal subjects, though no particulars are forthcoming, and, being deficient in gifts of silence, the displeasure of authority was marked by various checks, ending finally in his expulsion from the seminary. Such is one story at least, but an alternative says more simply that he relinquished the sacerdotal career in consequence of doubts and scruples. Thereafter he must, I suppose, have supported himself by some kind of teaching, and by obscure efforts in literature. Of these latter the remains are numerous, though their value has been much exaggerated for bookselling purposes in France. His adventures with Alphonse Esquiros over the Gospel of the Prophet Gano are told in the pages that follow, and are an interesting biographical fragment which may be left to speak for itself. He was then approaching the age of thirty years. I have failed to ascertain at what period he married Mlle Noemi, a girl of sixteen, who became afterwards of some repute as a sculptor, but it was a runaway match and in the end she left him. It is even said that she succeeded in a nullity suit, not on the usual grounds, for she had borne him two children, who died in their early years if not during infancy, but on the plea that she was a minor, while he had taken irrevocable vows. St. Sulpice is, however, a seminary for secular priests who are not pledged to celibacy, though the rule of the Latin Church forbids them to enter the married state. In or about the year 1851 Alphonse Louis Constant contributed a large volume to the encyclopedic series of Abbé Migny, under the title of Dictionnaire de Literature Christienne. He is described therein as ancien professeur au petit séminaire de Paris, and it is to be supposed that his past was unknown at the publishing bureau. The volume is more memorable on account of his later writings than important by its own merits. As a critical work, and indeed as a work of learning, it is naturally quite negligible. Like most productions of the series, while as a dictionary it is disproportioned and piecemeal, yet it is exceedingly readable and not unsuggestive in its views. There is no need to add that, as the circumstances of the case required, it is written along rigid lines of orthodoxy and is consequently no less narrow, no less illiberal, than the endless volumes of its predecessors and successors in the same field of industry. The doubting heart of St. Sulpice had become again a convinced Catholic, or had assumed that mask for the purpose of a particular literary production. For years later, however, the voice of the churchman, speaking the characteristic language of the Migni encyclopedias, was succeeded by the voice of the Magus. The doctrine of transcendental magic appeared in 1855, the ritual in 1856, and henceforth Alphonse Louis Constant, under the pseudonym of Eliphas Levi, which has become almost of European celebrity, was known only as an exponent of occult science. It is these works which more especially embody his claims in respect of the alleged science and in respect of his own absolute authority thereon and therein. Various later volumes, which followed from his pen in somewhat rapid succession, 
are very curious when compared with the doctrine and ritual for their apparent submission to church authority and their parade of sincere orthodoxy. I have dealt with this question at length in my introduction to the mysteries of magic, and I shall be dispensed therefore from covering the same ground in the present place. Such discrepancy notwithstanding, Eliphaz Levi became, in a private as well as in a public sense, a teacher of occult science and of cabalism as its primary source, it was apparently his means of livelihood. He was in Paris during the siege which brought the Franco-German War to its disastrous close, and he died in 1875, fortified by the last rites of the Catholic Church. He left behind him a large sheaf of manuscripts, many of which have been published since, and some await an editor. Passing now to the subject-in-chief of this preface, it is affirmed as follows in the doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic, 1. There is a potent and real magic, popular exaggerations of which are actually below the truth. 2. There is a formidable secret which constitutes the fatal science of good and evil. 3. It confers on man powers apparently superhuman. 4. It is the traditional science of the secrets of nature which has been transmitted to us from the Magi. 5. Initiation therein gives empire over souls to the sage and full capacity for ruling human wills. 6. Arising apparently from this science, there is one infallible, indefectible and truly Catholic religion which has always existed in the world, but it is unadapted for the multitude. 7. For this reason there has come into being the exoteric religion of apologue, fable and wonder stories, which is all that is possible for the profane, it has undergone various transformations, and it is represented at this day by Latin Christianity under the obedience of Rome. 8. Its veils are valid in their symbolism, and it may be called valid for the crowd, but the doctrine of initiates is tantamount to a negation of any literal truth therein. 9. It is magic alone which imparts true science. Hereof is what may be termed the theoretical, philosophical or doctrinal part, the dogma of absolute science. That which is practical follows, and it deals with the exercise of a natural power but one superior to the ordinary forces of nature. It is to all intents and purposes comprised in a grimoire of magic, and is a work of ceremonial evocations, whether of elementary spirits, with the aid of pantacles, talismans and the other magical instruments and properties, whether of spirits belonging ex hypothesi to the planetary sphere, whether of the shades or souls of the dead in necromancy. These works are lawful, and their results apparently veridic, but beyond them is the domain of black magic, which is a realm of delusion and nightmare, though phenomenal enough in its results. By his dedications Eliphaz Levi happened to be a magus of light. It will be observed that all this offers a clear issue, and, for the rest, the grimoire of transcendental magic, according to Eliphaz Levi, does not differ generically from the key of Solomon and its counterparts, except in so far as the author has excised here and enlarged there, in obedience to his own lights. He had full authority for doing so on the basis of his personal claims, which may be summarized at this point. 1. He has discovered the secret of human omnipotence and indefinite progress, the key of all symbolism, the first and final doctrine. 2. He is alchemist as well as magician, and he makes public the same secret as Raymond Lully, Nicholas Flamel and probably Heinrich Kunrath. They produced true gold, nor did they take away their secret with them. 3. And finally, at an epoch when the sanctuary has been devastated and has fallen into ruins, because its key has been thrown over the hedge, to the profit of no one, I have deemed it my duty to pick up that key, and I offer it to him who can take it, in his turn he will be doctor of the nations and liberator of the world. It must be said that these claims do not rest on a mere theory or practice of ceremonial evocations. There is no question that for Eliphaz Levi his secret doctrine of occult science is contained in a hypothesis concerning an universal medium denominated the astral light, which is neither more nor less than the odilic force of Baron Reichenbach, as the French writer himself admits substantially, but it is dilated in his speculation and issues therein greatly transformed as follows. 1. It is an universal plastic mediator, a common receptacle for vibrations of movement and images of form, it may be called the imagination of nature. 2. It is that which God created when he uttered the fiat lux. 3. 
It is the great medium of occult force, but as such it is a blind force, which can be used for good or evil, being especially obedient to the light of grace. 4. It is the element of electricity and lightning. 5. The four imponderable fluids are diverse manifestations of this one force, which is inseparable from the first matter and sets the latter in motion. 6. It is now resplendent, now igneous, now electric, now magnetic. 7. It has apparently two modes, which tend to equilibrium, and to know the middle point of this equilibrium seems to be the attainment of the great work. 8. It is ethereal in the infinite, astral in stars and planets, metallic, specific or mercurial in metals, vegetable in plants, vital in animals, magnetic or personal in men. 9. It is extracted from animals by absorption and from men by generation. 10. In magic it is the glass of visions, the receptacle of all reflections. The seer has his visions therein, the diviner divines by its means and the magus evokes spirits. 11. When the astral light is fixed about a center by condensation it becomes the philosophical stone of alchemy, in which form it is an artificial phosphorus, containing the concentrated virtues of all generative heat. 12. When condensed by a triple fire it resolves into oil, and this oil is the universal medicine. It can then only be contained in glass, this being a non-conductor. Again, here is a clear issue at its value, and I make this qualification because the astral light is, as I have said, a speculation, and personally I neither know nor care whether such a fluid exists, or, in such case, whether it is applicable to the uses indicated. It is enough that Eliphaz Levi has made his affirmations concerning it in unmistakable language. Let us pass therefore to the Histoire de la Magie, though I have been borrowing from it already in respect of the putative universal fluid. Magic therein is still the science of the ancient Magi, it is still the exact and absolute science of nature and her laws, because it is the science of equilibrium. Its secret, the secret of occult science, is that of God's omnipotence. It comprises all that is most certain in philosophy, all that is eternal and infallible in religion. It is the sacerdotal art and the royal art. Its chief memorial is found in Kabbalism, but it derives apparently from primeval Zoroastrian doctrine, of which Abraham seems to have been a depositary. This doctrine attained its perfection in Egypt. Thereafter, on its religious side, the succession appears to have been, a, from Egypt to Moses, b, from Moses to Solomon, through certain custodians of the secret law in Jewry, c, from the temple at Jerusalem to St. Peter's at Rome. Though the method of transition is obscure, as that which was affirmed previously is still maintained, namely, that Rome has lost the Kabbalistic keys. It is naturally left to our conjecture as to when the Church possessed them, from Eliphaz Levi's point of view, perhaps in the days of Dionysius, perhaps in those of Synesius, but not from my standpoint, and so the question remains. Now, if these things do not differ specifically from the heads of the previous testimony, on the surface and in the letter thereof, it is no less certain that there is a marked distinction alike in general atmosphere and inward spirit. About this all can satisfy themselves who will compare the two texts, and I need not insist on it here. What, however, in the Histoire de la Magie, has befallen that practical side which, after all the dreamings, the high and decorative philosophy, the adornments, now golden, now meretricious, was the evidence, term and crown of the previous work. Those who are reading can again check me, but my answer is this, whether the subject of the moment is the art of evoking spirits, whether it is old cases of possession, whether it is witchcraft or necromancy, whether it is modern phenomena like direct writing, table rapping and the other occurrences of spiritism, as they were known to the writer in his period, they have one and all fallen under the ban of unreserved condemnation. It is not that they are imposture, for Eliphaz Levi does not dispute the facts and derides those who do, but they belong to the abyss of delusion and all who practice them are workers of madness and apostles of evil only. The advent of Christianity has put a decisive period to every activity of magic and anathema has been pronounced thereon. It is from this point of view that Levi takes the disciple through each century of the subject, sometimes indeed explaining things from the standpoint of a complete skeptic, sometimes as Joseph Enemoser might himself have explained them, but never, 
no, not once, like the authorized exponent of practical magic who has tried the admirable and terrifying experiments, who returns to say that they are true and real, which is the testimony of the doctrine and ritual, if these volumes can be held to signify anything. Necromancy as a science of the abyss, spiritism as the abyss giving up every form of delusion, sorcery, witchcraft, as rich indeed in testimony but to human perversity alone, apart from intervention of diabolism belonging to the other world, I testify with my whole heart to the truth of these accusations. Though I do not believe that the unseen world is so utterly cut off from the world of things manifest as Eliphaz Levi considered in his own paradoxical moods. But once more, what has become of magic? What has happened to the one science which is coeval with creation itself, to the key of all miracles and to almost omnipotent adeptship? They are reduced as follows, a, to that which in its palmary respects is the sympathetic and miraculous physics, of Mesmer, who is grand as Prometheus because of them, b, to a general theory of hallucination, when hallucination has been carried, by self-induced delusion or otherwise, to its any plus ultra degree, and, c, but I mention this under very grave reserves, because, for the life of me, I do not understand how or why it should remain, to the physical operations of alchemy, which are still possible and actual under the condition set forth in the speculation concerning the astral light. It is not as such, one would say, a thaumaturgic process, unless indeed the dream should rule, as it tends to do, that fulfillment depends on an electrifying power in the projected will of the adept. In any case, the ethical transliteration of alchemical symbolism is seemingly a more important aspect of this subject. I need not register here that I disbelieve utterly in Levi's construction of the art of metallic transmutation, or that I regard his allegorizing thereon as a negligible product when it is compared with the real doctrine of hermetic mysticism, but this is not the point at issue. The possessor of the key of magic, of the Kabbalistic keys, thrown aside or lost by the Church, comes forward to tell us that after the advent of Christ, magical orthodoxy was transfigured into the orthodoxy of religion, that those who dissented could be only Illuminati and sorcerers, that the very name of magic must be interpreted only according to its evil sense, that we are forbidden by the Church to consult oracles, and that this is, in its great wisdom, that the fundamental dogma of transcendental science, attained its plenary realization in the constitution of the Christian world, being the equilibrium between church and state, all that is done outside the lawful hierarchy stands under an act of condemnation, as to visions, all fools are visionaries, to communicate with the hierarchy of unseen intelligence, we must seek the natural and mathematical revelations set forth in tarot cards, but it cannot be done without danger and crime while mediums, enchanters, fortune-tellers, and casters of spells, are generally diseased creatures in whom the void opens. Finally, as regards the philosophical side of magic, its great doctrine is equilibrium, its great hypothesis is analogy, and in the moral sense equilibrium is the concurrence of science and faith. What has happened to a writer who has thus gone back on his own most strenuous claims? One explanation is, and long ago I was inclined to it on my own part, that Eliphaz Levi had passed through certain grades of knowledge in a secret school of the instituted mysteries, that he was brought to a pause because of disclosures contained in his earlier books, and that he had been set to unsay what he had affirmed therein. I know now by what quality of school, working under what titles, this report was fabricated, and that it is the last with which I am acquainted to be accepted on its own statements, either respecting itself or any points of fact. An alternative is that Eliphaz Levi had spoken originally as a magus might be supposed to speak when trafficking in his particular wares, which is something like a quack doctor describing his nostrums to a populace in the marketplace, and that his later writings represent a process of retrenchment as to the most florid side of his claims. This notion is apart from all likelihood, because it offers no reason for the specific change in policy, while, if it be worth while to say so, I do not regard Levi as comparable to a quack doctor. I think that he had been a student of occult literature and history for a considerable period, in a very particular sense, that he believed himself to have discovered a key to all the alleged phenomena, that he wrote the doctrine and ritual in a mood of enthusiasm consequent thereupon, 
that between the appearance of these volumes and that of the Histoire de la Meiji he had reconsidered the question of the phenomena, and had come to the conclusion that so far from being veridic in their nature they were projected hallucinations variously differentiated and in successively aggravated grades, but that he still regarded his supposed universal fluid as a great provisional hypothesis respecting thaumaturgic facts, and that he still held to his general philosophy of the subject, being the persistence of a secret tradition from remote times and surviving at the present day, one, in the tenets of cabalism and, two, in the pictorial symbols of the tarot. It is no part of my province in the present connection to debate his views either on the fact of a secret tradition or on the alleged modes of its perpetuation, my standpoint is known otherwise and has been expressed fully elsewhere. But in the explanation just given I feel that I have saved the sincerity of one who has many titles to consideration, who is still respected by many, and for whom my own discriminating sympathy has been expressed frequently in no uncertain way, I have saved it so far at least as can be expected. One does not anticipate that a Frenchman, an occultist and a magus is going to retract distinctly under the eye of his disciples, more especially when he has testified so much. I feel further that I have justified the fact of the present translation of a work which is memorable in several respects, but chiefly as the history of a magic which is not magic, as a testimony which destroys indeed the whole imputed basis of its subject. It does not follow that Levi's explanation of physical phenomena, especially of the modern kind, is always or generally correct, but some of it is workable in its way, and my purpose is more than served if those who are drawn toward the science of the mystics may be led hereby to take warning as to some of the dangers and false seemings which fringe that science. A few things remain to be said. Readers of his history must be prepared for manifold inaccuracies, which are to be expected in a writer like Eliphaz Levi. Those who know anything of Egypt, the antiquities of its religion and literature, will have a bad experience with the chapter on hermetic magic, those who know Eastern religion on its deeper side will regard the discourse on magic in India as title deeds of all incompetence. While in respect of later Jewish theosophy I have had occasion in certain annotations to indicate that Levi had no extensive knowledge of those Kabbalistic texts on the importance of which he dwells so much and about which he claims to speak with full understanding. He presents, however, some of their lesser aspects. As regards the religion of his childhood, I feel certainly that it appealed to him strongly through all his life, and in the revulsion which seems to have followed the doctrine and ritual he was drawn back towards it, but rather as to a great hierarchic system and a great sequence of holy pageants, of living symbolism. Respecting the root matter of its teachings, probably he deceived himself better than he fooled his readers. In a multitude of statements and in the spirit of the text throughout, it is certain that the Histoire de la Meiji offers negation of dogma on its absolute side. We obtain a continual insight into free subsurface opinions, ill concealed under external conformity to the Church, and we get also useful sidelights on the vanity of the author's sham submissions. In this manner, we know exactly what quality of sentiment led him to lay all his writings at the foot of the seat of Peter for Peter to decide thereon. It is needless to add that his constructions of doctrine throughout are of the last kind that would be commended to the custodians of doctrine. At the same time there is very little doubt that he believed genuinely in the necessity of a hierarchic teaching, that, in his view, it reposed from a very early period in certain sanctuaries of initiation, that the existence of these is intimated in the records of the Mosaic Dispensation that they were depositaries of science rather than revelation, that Kabbalistic literature is one of their witnesses, but that the sanctuaries were everywhere in the world, Egypt and Greece included. Of all these the Church of Christ is the heir, and though it may have lost the keys of knowledge, though it mistakes everywhere the sign for the thing signified, it is, from his standpoint, entitled to our respect as a witness and at least to qualified obedience. I think that Eliphaz Levi has said true things and even great things on the distinctions and analogies between science and faith, but the latter he understood as aspiration, not as experience. A long essay on the mystics, which is perhaps his most important contribution to the Dictionnaire de Literature Christienne, indicates that he was thinly acquainted with the mind of Suso, Saint John of the Cross, Saint Teresa and Saint Francis of Sales. Accordingly he has a word here and there on the interior life and its secrets, 
but of that which remains for the elect in the heights of sanctity he had no consciousness whatever. For him the records of such experience are literature and mystic poetry, and as he is far from the term herein, so is he remote also when he discourses of false mystics, meaning Gnostic sects, Albigensian sects, Illuminati so-called and members of secret heretical societies representing reform doctrine. As the religion of the mystics is my whole concern in literature, let me add that the true idea of religion is not constituted by universal suffrage, see text, page 517, but by the agreement of those who have attained in the divine experience that which is understood by attainment. In conclusion, after we have set aside, on the warrants of this history, the phenomenal side of magic, that which may be held to remain in the mind of the author is transcendental magic, referred to when I spoke of a qualification earlier in these remarks, but by this is to be understood so much of the old philosophical systems as had passed within his consciousness and had been interpreted therein. It will be unacceptable to most readers at this day, but it has curious aspects of interest and may be left to stand at its value. A. E. Wait. Introduction. Magic has been confounded too long with the jugglery of mountebanks, the hallucinations of disordered minds and the crimes of certain unusual malefactors. There are otherwise many who would promptly explain magic as the art of producing effects in the absence of causes, and on the strength of such a definition it will be said by ordinary people, with the good sense which characterizes the ordinary, in the midst of much injustice, that magic is an absurdity. But it can have no analogy in fact with the descriptions of those who know nothing of the subject, furthermore, it is not to be represented as this or that by any person whomsoever, it is that which it is, drawing from itself only, even as mathematics do, for it is the exact and absolute science of nature and her laws. Magic is the science of the ancient magi, and the Christian religion, which silenced the counterfeit oracles and put a stop to the illusions of false gods, does, this notwithstanding, revere those mystic kings who came from the East, led by a star, to adore the Savior of the world in his cradle. They are elevated by tradition to the rank of kings, because magical initiation constitutes a true royalty, because also the great art of the Magi is characterized by all adepts as the royal art, as the holy kingdom, sanctum regnum. The star which conducted the pilgrims is the same burning star which is met with in all initiations. For alchemists it is the sign of the quintessence, for magicians it is the great arcanum, for Kabbalists the sacred pentagram. Our design is to prove that the study of this pentagram did itself lead the magi to a knowledge of that new name which was to be exalted above all names and to bend the knees of all beings who were capable of adoration. Magic, therefore, combines in a single science that which is most certain in philosophy, which is eternal and infallible in religion. It reconciles perfectly and incontestably those two terms, so opposed on the first view, faith and reason, science and belief, authority and liberty. It furnishes the human mind with an instrument of philosophical and religious certitude as exact as mathematics, and even accounting for the infallibility of mathematics themselves. An absolute exists therefore in the realms of understanding and faith. The lights of human intelligence have not been left by the supreme reason to waver at hazard. There is an incontestable truth, there is an infallible method of knowing that truth, while those who attain this knowledge, and adopt it as a rule of life, can endow their will with a sovereign power which can make them masters of all inferior things, all wandering spirits, or, in other words, arbiters and kings of the world. If such be the case, how comes it that so exalted a science is still unrecognized? How is it possible to assume that so bright a sun is hidden in a sky so dark? The transcendental science has been known always, but only to the flowers of intelligence, who have understood the necessity of silence and patience. Should a skillful surgeon open at midnight the eyes of a man born blind, it would still be impossible to make him realize the nature or existence of daylight till morning came. Science has its nights and its mornings, because the life which it communicates to the world of mind is characterized by regular modes of motion and progressive phases. It is the same with truths as it is with radiations of light. Nothing which is hidden is lost, but at the same time nothing that is found is absolutely new. The seal of eternity is affixed by God to that science which is the reflection of His glory. The Transcendental Science 
The absolute science is assuredly magic, though the affirmation may seem utterly paradoxical to those who have never questioned the infallibility of Voltaire, that marvelous smatterer who thought that he knew so much because he never missed an opportunity for laughter instead of learning. Magic was the science of Abraham and Orpheus, of Confucius and Zoroaster, and it was magical doctrines which were graven on tables of stone by Enoch and by Trismegistus. Moses purified and reveiled them, this being the sense of the word reveal. The new disguise which he gave them was that of the Holy Kabbalah, that exclusive heritage of Israel and inviolable secret of its priests. The mysteries of Eleusis and of Thebes preserved among the Gentiles some of its symbols, but in a debased form, and the mystic key was lost amidst the apparatus of an ever-increasing superstition. Jerusalem, murderer of its prophets and prostituted over and over again to false Assyrian and Babylonian gods, ended by losing in its turn the sacred word, when a Saviour, declared to the Magi by the holy star of initiation, came to rend the threadbare veil of the old temple, to endow the church with a new network of legends and symbols, ever concealing from the profane and always preserving for the elect that truth which is the same for ever. It is this that the erudite and ill-starred Dupuis should have found on Indian planispheres and in tables of Dendera, he would not have ended by rejecting the truly Catholic or universal and eternal religion in the presence of the unanimous affirmation of all nature, as well as all monuments of science throughout the ages. It was the memory of this scientific and religious absolute, of this doctrine summarized in a word, of this word alternately lost and recovered, which was transmitted to the elect of all antique initiations. Whether preserved or profaned in the celebrated order of the temple, it was this same memory handed on to secret associations of Rosicrucians, Illuminati, and Freemasons which gave a meaning to their strange rites, to their less or more conventional signs, and a justification above all to their devotion in common, as well as a clue to their power. That profanation has befallen the doctrines and mysteries of magic we have no intention to deny, repeated from age to age, the misuse itself has been a great and terrible lesson for those who made secret things unwisely known. The Gnostics caused the Gnosis to be prohibited by Christians, and the official sanctuary was closed to high initiation. The hierarchy of knowledge was thus compromised by the intervention of usurping ignorance, while the disorders within the sanctuary were reproduced in the state, for, willingly or otherwise, the king always depends from the priest, and it is towards the eternal adytum of divine instruction that earthly powers will ever look for consecration and for energy to ensure their permanence. The key of science has been thrown to children, as might have been expected, it is now, therefore, mislaid and practically lost. This notwithstanding, a man of high intuitions and great moral courage, Count Joseph de Maister, who was also a resolute Catholic, acknowledging that the world was void of religion and could not so remain, turned his eyes instinctively towards the last sanctuaries of occultism and called, with heartfelt prayers, for that day when the natural affinity which subsists between science and faith should combine them in the mind of a single man of genius. This will be grand, said he, it will finish that eighteenth century which is still with us. We shall talk then of our present stupidity as we now dilate on the barbarism of the Middle Ages. The prediction of Count Joseph de Maister is in course of realization, the alliance of science and faith, accomplished long since, is here in fine made manifest, though not by a man of genius. Genius is not needed to see the sun, and, moreover, it has never demonstrated anything but its rare greatness and its lights inaccessible to the crowd. The grand truth demands only to be found, when the simplest will be able to comprehend it and to prove it also at need. At the same time that truth will never become vulgar, because it is hierarchic and because anarchy alone humors the bias of the crowd. The masses are not in need of absolute truths, were it otherwise, progress would be arrested and life would cease in humanity, the ebb and flow of contrary ideas, the clash of opinions, the passions of the time, ever impelled by its dreams, are necessary to the intellectual growth of peoples. The masses know it full well, and hence they desert so readily the chair of doctors to collect about the rostrum of mountebanks. Some even who are assumed to be concerned in philosophy, and that perhaps especially, too often resemble the children playing at charades, who hasten to turn out those who know the answer already, lest the game should be spoiled by depriving the puzzle of the questions of all its interest. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God, has been said by eternal wisdom. Purity of heart therefore purifies intelligence, and rectitude of will makes for precision in understanding. Whosoever prefers truth and justice before all things shall have justice and truth for his reward, because supreme providence has endowed us with freedom in order that we may attain life, and very truth, all its exactitude notwithstanding, intervenes only with mildness, never does outrage to tardiness or violence to the errors of our will when it is beguiled by the allurements of falsehood. It remains, however, according to Bossuet, that antecedent to anything which may please or repel our senses, there is a truth, and it is by this that our conduct should be governed, not by our appetites. The kingdom of heaven is not the empire of caprice, either in respect of man or God. A thing is not just because it is willed by God, said St. Thomas, but God wills it because it is just. The divine balance rules and necessitates eternal mathematics. God has made all things with number, weight and measure, here it is the Bible speaking. Measure an angle of creation, make a proportionally progressive multiplication, and all infinity shall multiply its circles, peopled by universes, passing in proportional segments between the extending symbolical arms of your compass. Suppose now that, from whatever point of the infinite above you, a hand holds another compass or square, then the lines of the celestial triangle will meet of necessity those of the compass of science and will form there with the mysterious star of Solomon. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again, says the Gospel. God does not strive with man that he may crush man by his grandeur, and he never places unequal weights in his balance. When he would test the strength of Jacob, he assumes the form of man, the patriarch withstands the onset through an entire night, at the end there is a blessing for the conquered and, in addition to the glory of having sustained such a struggle, he is given the national title of Israel, being a name which signifies, strong against God. We have heard Christians more zealous than instructed hazarding a strange explanation of the dogma concerning eternal punishment by suggesting that God may avenge infinitely an offense which itself is finite, because if the offender is limited the grandeur of the offended being is not. An emperor of the world might, on the strength of a similar pretext, sentenced to death some unreasoning child who had soiled accidentally the hem of his purple. Far otherwise are the prerogatives of greatness, and St. Augustine understood them better when he said that, God is patient because he is eternal. In God all is justice, seeing that all is goodness, he never forgives after the manner of men, for he is never angered like them, but evil being, by its nature, incompatible with good, as night is with day, as discord is with harmony, and the liberty of man being furthermore inviolable, all error is expiated and all evil punished by suffering proportion thereto. It is vain to invoke the help of Jupiter when our cart is stuck in the mud, unless we take pick and shovel, like the wagoner in the fable, heaven will not draw us out of the rut. Help yourself and God will help you. In such a reasonable and wholly philosophical way is explained the possible and necessary eternity of punishment, with still a narrow way open for man to escape therefrom, being that of toil and repentance. It is by conformity with the rules of eternal power that man may unite himself to the creative energy and become creator and preserver in his turn. God has not limited narrowly the number of rounds on Jacob's ladder of light. Whatsoever nature has constituted inferior to man is thereby to him made subject, it is for man to extend his domain in virtue of continual ascent. Length and even perpetuity of life, the field of air and its storms, the earth and its metallic veins, light and its wondrous illusions, darkness and the dreams thereof, death and its ghosts, all these do therefore obey the royal scepter of the Magi, the shepherd staff of Jacob and the terrible wand of Moses. The adept becomes king of the elements, transmuter of metals, interpreter of visions, controller of oracles, master of life in fine, according to the mathematical order of nature and conformably to the will of the supreme intelligence. This is magic in all its glory. But is there anyone who in these days will dare to give credence to such words? The answer is, those who will study loyally and attain knowledge frankly. We make no attempt to conceal truth under the veil of parables or hieroglyphical signs, the time has come when everything should be told, and we propose to tell everything. It is our intention, in short, to unveil that ever-secret science which, as we have indicated, 
is hidden behind the shadows of ancient mysteries, which the Gnostics betrayed clumsily, or rather disfigured unworthily, which is recognized dimly under the darkness shrouding the pretended crimes of Templars, which is met with once again beneath the now impenetrable enigmas of high-grade Masonic rites. We purpose further to bring into open day the fantastic King of the Sabbath, to expose the very roots of black magic and its frightful realities, long since surrendered to the derision of the grandchildren of Voltaire. For a great number of readers magic is the science of the devil, even as the science of light is identified with that of darkness. We confess boldly at the outset that we are not in terror of the devil. My fear is for those who fear him, said Saint Teresa. But we testify also that he does not prompt our laughter and that the ridicule of which he is often the object seems to us exceedingly misplaced. However this may be, it is our intention to bring him before the light of science. But the devil and science, the apposition of two names so strangely incongruous, must seem to have disclosed the whole intent in view. If the mystic personification of darkness be thus dragged into light, is it not to annihilate the phantom of falsehood in the presence of truth? Is it not to dispel in the day all formless monsters of the night? Superficial persons will think so and will condemn without hearing. Ill-instructed Christians will conclude that we are sapping the fundamental dogma of their ethics by decrying hell, and others will question the utility of combating error in which, as they imagine, no one believes longer. It is, therefore, important to enunciate our object clearly and establish our principles solidly. We say, therefore, to Christians that the author of this book is a Christian like yourselves. His faith is that of a Catholic strongly and deeply convinced, for this reason he does not come forward to deny dogmas, but to combat impiety under its most pernicious forms, which are those of false belief and superstition. He comes to drag from the darkness the black successor of Araman, in order to expose in broad day his colossal impotence and redoubtable misery. He comes to make subject the age-long problem of evil to the solutions of science, to uncrown the king of hell and to bow down his head at the foot of the cross. Is not virginal and maternal science, that science of which Mary is the sweet and luminous image, destined like her to crush the head of the old serpent? The author, on the other hand, would say to pretended philosophy, why seek to deny that which you cannot understand? Is not the unbelief which affirms in the face of the unknown more precipitate and less consoling than faith? Does the dreadful form of personified evil only prompt you to smile? Hear you not the ceaseless sobbing of humanity which writhes and weeps in the crushing folds of the monster? Have you never heard the atrocious laugh of the evildoer who is persecuting the just man? Have you never experienced in yourselves the opening of those infernal deeps which the genius of perversity furrows in every soul? Moral evil exists, such is the unhappy truth, it reigns in certain spirits, it incarnates in certain men, it is therefore personified, and thus demons exist, but the most wicked of these demons is Satan. More than this I do not ask you to admit, and it will be difficult for you to grant me less. Let it be otherwise and clearly understood that science and faith render mutual support to one another only in so far as their respective realms remain inviolably distinct. What is it that we believe? That which we do not know absolutely, though we may yearn for it with all our strength. The object of faith is not more than an indispensable hypothesis for science, the things which are in the domain of knowledge must never be judged by the processes of faith, nor, conversely, the things of faith according to the measures of science. The end of faith is not scientifically debatable. I believe because it is absurd, said Tertullian, and this utterance, paradoxical on the surface as it is, belongs to the highest reason. As a fact, beyond all that we can suppose rationally there is an infinite towards which we aspire with unquenchable thirst, and it eludes even our dreams. But is not the infinite itself an absurdity for our finite appreciation? We feel all the same that it is, the infinite invades us, overflows us, renders us dizzy at its abysses and crushes us by its awful height. Scientifically probable hypotheses are one and all the last half-lights or shadows of science, faith begins where reason falls exhausted. Beyond human reason there is that reason which is divine, for my weakness a supreme absurdity, but an infinite absurdity which confounds me, and in which I believe. The good alone is infinite evil is not, 
and hence if God be the eternal object of faith, then the devil belongs to science. In which of the Catholic creeds is there any question concerning him? Would it not be blasphemy to say that we believe in him? In Holy Scripture he is named but not defined. Genesis makes no allusion to a reputed revolt of angels, it ascribes the fall of Adam to the serpent, as to the most subtle and dangerous of living beings. We are acquainted with Christian tradition on this subject, but if that tradition is explicable by one of the greatest and most diffused allegories of science, what can such solution signify to the faith which aspires only to God, which despises the pomps and works of Lucifer? Lucifer, light-bearer, how strange a name, attributed to the spirit of darkness! Is it he who carries the light and yet blinds feeble souls? The answer is yes, unquestionably, for traditions are full of divine disclosures and inspirations. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, says St. Paul. And Christ himself said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So also the prophet Isaiah, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer is then a fallen star, a meteor which is on fire always, which burns when it enlightens no longer. But is this Lucifer a person or a force, an angel or a strayed thunderbolt? Tradition supposes that it is an angel, but the psalmist says, who mocketh his angel spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. The word angel is applied in the Bible to all messengers of God, emissaries or new creations, revealers or scourges, radiant spirits or brilliant objects. The shafts of fire which the Most High darts through the clouds are angels of his wrath, and such figurative language is familiar to all readers of Eastern poetry. Having been the world's terror through the period of the Middle Ages, the devil has become its mockery. Heir to the monstrous forms of all false gods cast down successively from their thrones, the grotesque scarecrow has turned into a mere bugbear through very deformity and hideousness. Yet observe as to this that those only dare to laugh at the devil who know not the fear of God. Can it be that for many diseased imaginations he is God's own shadow, or is he not often the idol of degenerate souls who only understand supernatural power as the exercise of cruelty with impunity? But it is important to ascertain whether the notion of this evil power can be reconciled with that of God, in a word, whether the devil exists, and in such case what he is. There is no longer any question of superstition or of ridiculous invention, it is a question of religion alone and hence of the whole future, with all the interests, of humanity. Strange reasoners indeed are we, we call ourselves strong-minded when we are indifferent to everything except material advantages, as, for example, money, and we leave to their own devices the ideas which are mothers of opinions and may, or at least can, by their sudden veering, upset all fortunes. A conquest of science is much more important than the discovery of a gold mine. Given science, gold is utilized in the service of life, given ignorance, wealth furnishes only destroying weapons. For the rest, it is to be understood absolutely that our scientific revelations pause in the presence of faith, that, as Christian and Catholic, our work is submitted entirely to the supreme judgment of the Church. This said, to those who question the existence of a devil, we would point out that whatsoever has a name exists, speech may be uttered in vain, but in itself it cannot be vain, and it has a meaning invariably. The word is never void, and if it be written that it is in God, as also that it is God, this is because it is the expression and the proof of being and of truth. The devil is named and personified in the gospel, which is the word of truth, he exists therefore and can be considered as a person. But here it is the Christian who defers, let science or reason speak, these two are one. Evil exists, it is impossible to doubt it, we can work good or evil. There are beings who work evil knowingly and willingly. The spirit which animates these beings and prompts them to do ill is berayed, turned aside from the right road, and thrown across the path of good as an obstacle, this is the precise meaning of the Greek word diabolos, which we render as devil. The spirits who love and perform evil are accidentally bad. There is therefore a devil who is the spirit of error, willful ignorance, vertigo, there are beings under his obedience who are his envoys, emissaries, angels, and it is for this reason that the gospel speaks of an eternal fire which is prepared, and in a sense predestined, 
for the devil and his angels. These words are themselves a revelation, so let us search their meaning, giving, in the first place, a concise definition of evil. Evil is the absence of rectitude in being. Moral evil is falsehood in action, as the lie is a crime in speech. Injustice is of the essence of lying, and every lie is an injustice. When that which we utter is just, there is no falsity. When that which we do is equitable and true in mode, there is no sin. Injustice is the death of moral being, as lying is the poison of intelligence. The false spirit is therefore a spirit of death. Those who hearken to him become his dupes and are by him poisoned. But if we had to take his absolute personification seriously, he would be himself absolutely dead and absolutely deceived, which means that the affirmation of his existence must imply a patent contradiction. Jesus said that the devil is a liar like his father. Who then is the father of the devil? Whosoever gives him a personal existence by living in accordance with his inspirations, the man who diabolizes himself is the father of the incarnate spirit of evil. But there is a rash, impious and monstrous conception, traditional like the pride of the Pharisees, and in fine there is a hybrid creation which armed the paltry philosophy of the eighteenth century with an apparent defense. It is the false Lucifer of the heterodox legend, that angel proud enough to think that he was God, brave enough to buy independence at the price of eternal torment, beautiful enough to worship himself in the plenary divine light, strong enough to reign still in darkness and in dole and to make a throne of his inextinguishable fire. It is the Satan of the heretical and republican Milton, the pretended hero of black eternities, calumniated by deformity, bedecked with horns and talons which would better become his implacable tormentor. It is the devil who is king of evil, as if evil were a kingdom, who is more intelligent than the men of genius that fear his wiles. It is, a, that black light, that darkness with eyes, that power which God has not willed but which no fallen creature could create, b, that prince of anarchy served by a hierarchy of pure spirits, c, that exile of God who on earth seems, like him, everywhere, but is more tangible, is more for the majority in evidence, and is served better than God himself, d, that conquered one, to whom the victor gives his children that he may devour them, e, that artificer of sins of the flesh, to whom flesh is nothing, and who therefore can be nothing to flesh, unless indeed he be its creator and master, like God, f, that immense, realized, personified and eternal lie, g, that death which cannot die, h, that blasphemy which the word of God will never silence, i, that poisoner of souls whom God tolerates by a contradiction of his omnipotence or preserves as the Roman emperors guarded locusta among the trophies of their reign, k, that executed criminal, living still to curse his judge and still have a cause against him, since he will never repent, l, that monster accepted as executioner by the sovereign power, and who, according to the forcible expression of an old Catholic writer, may term God the God of the devil by describing himself as a devil of God. Such is the irreligious phantom which blasphemes religion. Away with this idol which hides our Saviour. Down with the tyrant of falsehood, the black god of Manichaeans, the Araman of old idolaters. Live God and his word incarnate, who saw Satan fall from heaven. And live Mary, the Divine Mother, who crushed the head of the infernal serpent. So cry with one voice the traditions of saints, and so cry faithful hearts. The attribution of any greatness whatsoever to a fallen spirit is a slander on divinity, the ascription of any royalty whatsoever to the rebel spirit is to encourage revolt and be guilty, at least in thought, of that crime which the horror of the Middle Ages termed sorcery. For all the offenses visited with death on the old sorcerers were real crimes and were indeed the greatest of all. They stole fire from heaven, like Prometheus, they rode winged dragons and the flying serpent, like Medea, they poisoned the breathable air, like the shadow of the manchineal tree, they profaned sacred things and even used the body of the Lord in works of destruction and malevolence. How is all this possible? Because there is a composite agent, a natural and divine agent, at once corporeal and spiritual, an universal plastic mediator, a common receptacle for vibrations of movement and images of form, a fluid, and a force which may be called, in a sense at least, the imagination of nature. 
By the mediation of this force every nervous apparatus is in secret communication together. Hence come sympathy and antipathy, hence dreams, hence the phenomena of second sight and extranatural vision. This universal agent of nature's works is the O.D. of the Jews and of Reichenbach, the astral light of the Martinists, which denomination we prefer as the more explicit. The existence and possible employment of this force constitute the great secret of practical magic, it is the wand of thaumaturgy and the key of black magic. It is the Ednik serpent who transmitted to Eve the seductions of a fallen angel. The astral light warms, illuminates, magnetizes, attracts, repels, vivifies, destroys, coagulates, separates, breaks and conjoins everything, under the impetus of powerful wills. God created it on the first day, when He said, Let there be light. This force of itself is blind but is directed by egregores, that is, by chiefs of souls, or, in other words, by energetic and active spirits. Herein is the complete explanatory theory of prodigies and miracles. How, as a fact, could good and bad alike compel nature to reveal her hidden forces, how could there be divine and diabolical miracles? How could the reprobate and berate spirit have more power in certain ways and cases than the just spirit, which is in truth so powerful in simplicity and wisdom, unless we postulate an instrument which all can use, upon certain conditions, but some for the great good and others for the great evil. Pharaoh's magicians accomplished at first the same miracles as Moses. The instrument which they used was therefore the same, the inspiration alone differed, when they confessed themselves conquered, they proclaimed that, for them, human powers had reached their limit and that there must be something superhuman in Moses. This took place in Egypt, that mother of magical initiations, that land where it was all occult science, hierarchic and sacred instruction. Was it, however, more difficult to make flies appear than frogs? No, assuredly, but the magicians knew that the fluidic projection by which the eyes are biologized cannot proceed beyond certain bounds, and these had been passed already by Moses. A particular phenomenon occurs when the brain is congested or overcharged by astral light, sight is turned inward, instead of outward. Night falls on the external and real world, while fantastic brilliance shines on the world of dreams, even the physical eyes experience a slight quivering and turn up inside the lids. The soul then perceives by means of images the reflection of its impressions and thoughts. This is to say that the analogy subsisting between idea and form attracts in the astral light a reflection representing that form, configuration being the essence of the vital light, it is the universal imagination, of which each of us appropriates a lesser or greater part according to our grade of sensibility and memory. Therein is the source of all apparitions, all extraordinary visions and all the intuitive phenomena peculiar to madness or ecstasy. The appropriation or assimilation of the light by clairvoyant sensibility is one of the greatest phenomena which can be studied by science. It may be understood in a day to come that seeing is actually speaking and that the consciousness of light is a twilight of eternal life in being. The Word of God Himself, who creates light, and is uttered by all intelligence that conceives of forms and seeks to visualize them. Let there be light. Light in the mode of brightness exists only for eyes which look thereon, and the soul enamored with the pageant of universal beauty, and fixing its attention on that luminous script of the endless book which is called Things Manifest, seems to cry on its own part, as God at the dawn of the first day, the sublime and creative words, Fiat Lux. We do not all see with the same eyes, and creation is not for all the same in color and form. Our brain is a book printed within and without, and with the smallest degree of excitement, the writing becomes blurred, as occurs continually in cases of intoxication and madness. Dream then triumphs over real life and plunges reason in a sleep which knows no waking. This condition of hallucination has its degrees, all passions are intoxications, all enthusiasms are comparative and graduated manias. The lover sees only infinite perfections encompassing that object by which he is fascinated. But, unhappy infatuation of voluptuaries, tomorrow this odor of wine which allures him will become a repugnant reminiscence, causing a thousand loathings and a thousand disgusts. To understand the use of this force, but never to be obsessed and never overcome thereby, 
is to trample on the serpent's head. And it is this which we learn from the magic of light, in such secrets are contained all mysteries of magnetism, which name can indeed be applied to the whole practical part of antique transcendental magic. Magnetism is the wand of miracles, but it is this for initiates only, for rash and uninstructed people, who would sport with it or make it subserve their passions, it is as dangerous as that consuming glory which, according to the allegorical fable, destroyed the too ambitious Semele in the embraces of Jupiter. One of the great benefits of magnetism is that it demonstrates by incontestable facts the spirituality, unity, and immortality of the soul, and these things once made certain, God is manifested to all intelligences and all hearts. Thereafter, from the belief in God and from the harmonies of creation, we are led to that great religious harmony which does not exist outside the miraculous and lawful hierarchy of the Catholic Church, for this alone has preserved all traditions of science and faith. The primal tradition of the one and only revelation has been preserved under the name of Kabbalah by the priesthood of Israel. Kabbalistic doctrine, which is that of transcendental magic, is contained in the Sefer Yetzirah, the Zohar and the Talmud. According to this doctrine, the Absolute is being, and therein is the Word, which expresses the reason of being and of life. The principle therefore is that being is being, Ihye Asher Ihye. In the beginning the Word was, which means that it is, has been, and shall be, and this is reason which speaks. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is the reason of belief, and therein also is the expression of that faith which gives life to science. The Word, or Logos, is the wellspring of logic. Jesus is the incarnate Word. The concord of reason with faith, of science with belief, of authority with liberty, has become in these modern days the real enigma of the Sphinx. Coincidentally with this great problem there has come forward that which concerns the respective rights of man and woman. This was inevitable, for between the several terms of a great and supreme question, there is a constant analogy, and the difficulties, like the correspondences, are invariably the same. The loosening of this Gordian knot of philosophy in modern politics is rendered apparently paradoxical, because in order to effect an agreement between the terms of the required equation, there is always a tendency to confuse the one with the other. If there is anything that deserves to be called supreme absurdity, it is to inquire how faith becomes a reason, reason a belief and liberty an authority, or reciprocally, how the woman becomes a man and the man a woman. The definitions themselves intervene against such confusion, and it is by maintaining a perfect distinction between the terms, and so only, that we can bring them into agreement. The perfect and eternal distinction between the two primal terms of the creative syllogism, for the demonstration of their harmony in virtue of the analogy of opposites, is the second great principle of that occult philosophy veiled under the name of Kabbalah and indicated by all sacred hieroglyphics of the old sanctuaries, as by the rites, even now understood so little, of ancient and modern masonry. We read in Scripture that Solomon erected two brazen columns before the door of his temple, one of them being called Jachin and the other Boaz, meaning the strong and the weak. These two pillars represented man and woman, reason and faith, power and liberty, Cain and Abel, right and duty. They were pillars of the intellectual and moral world, the monumental hieroglyphic of the antinomy inevitable to the grand law of creation. The meaning is that every force postulates a resistance on which it can work, every light a shadow as its foil, every convex a concave, every influx a receptacle, every reign a kingdom, every sovereign a people, every workman a first matter, every conqueror something to overcome. Affirmation rests on negation, the strong can only triumph because of weakness, the aristocracy cannot be manifested except by rising above the people. For the weak to become strong, for the people to acquire an aristocratic position, is a question of transformation and of progress, but it is without prejudice to the first principles, the weak will be ever the weak and it matters nothing if they are not always the same persons. The people in like manner will ever remain the people, the mass which is ruled and is not capable of ruling. In the vast army of inferiors, every personal emancipation is an automatic desertion, which, happily, is imperceptible because it is replaced, also automatically, a king nation or a people of kings would presuppose the slavery of the world and anarchy in a single city, outside all discipline, as at Rome in the days of its greatest glory. 
A nation of sovereigns would be inevitably as anarchic as a class of experts or of scholars who deemed that they were masters. There would be none to listen, all would dogmatize and all give orders at once. The radical emancipation of womanhood falls within the same category. If, integrally and radically, the woman leaves the passive and enters the active condition, she abdicates her sex and becomes man, or rather, as such a transformation is impossible physically, she attains affirmation by a double negation, placing herself outside both sexes, like a sterile and monstrous androgyne. These are strict consequences of the great Kabbalistic dogma respecting that distinction of contraries which reaches harmony by the analogy of their proportions. This dogma once recognized, and the application of its results being made universally by the law of analogies, will mean a discovery of the greatest secrets concerning maternal sympathy and antipathy, it will mean also a discovery of the science of government in things political, in marriage, in all branches of occult medicine, whether magnetism, homeopathy, or moral influence. Moreover, and as it is intended to explain, the law of equilibrium in analogy leads to the discovery of an universal agent which was the grand secret of alchemists and magicians in the Middle Ages. It has been said that this agent is a light of life by which animated beings are rendered magnetic, electricity being only its accident and transient perturbation, so to speak. The practice of that marvelous Kabbalah to which we shall turn shortly, for the satisfaction of those who look, in the secret sciences, after emotions rather than wise teachings, reposes entirely in the knowledge and use of this agent. The religion of the Kabbalists is at once hypothesis and certitude, for it proceeds from known to unknown by the help of analogy. They recognize religion as a need of humanity, as an evident and necessary fact, and it is this alone which for them is divine, permanent and universal revelation. They dispute about nothing which is, but they provide the reason for everything. So also their doctrine, by distinguishing clearly the line of demarcation which must exist forever between science and faith, provides a basis for faith in the highest reason, guaranteeing its incontestable and permanent duration. After this come the popular forms of doctrine, which alone can vary and alone destroy one another, the Kabbalist is not only undisturbed by trivialities of this kind, but can provide on the spot a reason for the most astonishing formulae. It follows that his prayer can be joined to that of humanity at large, to direct it by illustrations from science and reason and draw it into orthodox channels. If Mary be mentioned, he will revere the realization in her of all that is divine in the dreams of innocence, all that is adorable in the sacred enthusiasm of every maternal heart. It is not he who will refuse flowers to adorn the altars of the Mother of God, or white banners for her chapels, or even tears for her ingenuous legends. It is not he who will mock at the newborn God weeping in the manger or the wounded victim of Calvary. He repeats nevertheless, from the bottom of his heart, like the sages of Israel and the faithful believers of Islam, there is no God but God. For the initiates of true science, this signifies, there is but one being, and this is being, but all that is expedient and touching in beliefs, but the splendor of rituals, the pageant of divine creations, the grace of prayers, the magic of heavenly hopes, are not these the radiance of moral life in all its youth and beauty? Could anything alienate the true initiate from public prayers and temples, could anything raise his disgust or indignation against religious forms of all kinds, it would be the manifest unbelief of priests or people, want of dignity in the ceremonies of the cultus, in a word, the profanation of holy things. God is truly present when He is worshipped by recollected souls and feeling hearts, He is absent, sensibly and terribly, when discussed without light or zeal, that is to say, without understanding or love. The adequate conception of God according to instructed Kabbalism is that which was revealed by St. Paul when he said that to attain God we must believe that He is and that He recompenses those who seek Him out. So is there nothing outside the idea of being, in combination with the idea of goodness and justice, these alone are absolute. To say that there is no God or to define what He is, constitutes equal blasphemy. Every definition of God hazarded by human intelligence is a recipe of religious empiricism, out of which superstition will subsequently extract a devil. In Kabbalistic symbolism the representation of God is always by a duplicated image, one erect, the other reversed, one white, and the other black. 
In such manner did the sages seek to express the intelligent and vulgar conceptions of the same idea, that of the god of light and the god of shadow. To the miscomprehension of this symbol must be referred the Persian Araman, that black but divine ancestor of all demons. The dream of the infernal king is but a false notion of God. Light in the absence of shadow would be invisible for our eyes, since it would produce an overpowering brilliance equal to the greatest darkness. In the analogies of this physical truth, understood and considered adequately, a solution will be found for one of the most terrible of problems, the origin of evil. But to grasp it fully, together with all its consequences, is not meant for the multitude, who must not penetrate so readily into the secrets of universal harmony. It was only after the initiate of the Eleusinian mysteries had passed victoriously through all the tests, had seen and touched the holy things, that, if he were judged strong enough to withstand the last and most dreadful secret, a veiled priest passed him at flying pace and uttered in his ear the enigmatic words, Osiris is a black god. So was Osiris, of whom Typhon is the oracle, and so was the divine religious son of Egypt, eclipsed suddenly, becoming the shadow of that grand, indefinable Isis who is all that has been and shall be, and whose eternal veil has no one lifted. Light is the active principle for Kabbalists, while darkness is analogous to the passive principle, for which reason they regarded the sun and moon as emblems of the two divine sexes and the two creative forces. So also they attributed to woman the first temptation and sin, and subsequently the first labor, the maternal labor of redemption, it is from the bosom of the dark itself that light is reborn. The void attracts the plenum, and thus the abyss of poverty and wretchedness, pretended evil, seeming nothingness and the ephemeral rebellion of creatures, attracts eternally an ocean of being, wealth, mercy and love. This interprets the symbol of the Christ descending into hell after pouring out upon the cross all immensities of the most marvelous forgiveness. By the same law of harmony in the analogy of opposites the Kabbalists explain also all mysteries of sexual love. Why is this passion more permanent between two unequal natures and two contrary characters? Why is there in love one always who immolates and one who is victim? Why are the most obstinate passions those the satisfaction of which would seem impossible? By this law also they would have decided once and forever the question of precedence between the sexes, as brought forward in all seriousness by the Saint Simonism of our own day. The natural strength of woman being that of inertia or resistance, they would have ruled that modesty is the most imprescriptible of her rights, and hence that she must neither perform nor desire anything demanding a species of masculine boldness. Nature has otherwise provided to this end by giving her a soft voice, not to be heard in large assemblies, unless raised to a ridiculously discordant pitch. She who would aspire to the functions of the opposite sex must forfeit thereby the prerogatives of her own. We know not to what point she may arrive in the ruling of men, but it is certain at least that in reaching it she will lose the love of men and, that which will be more cruel for her, the love of children. The conjugal law of the Kabbalists furnishes further, by analogy, a solution of the most interesting and difficult problem of modern philosophy, being the agreement between reason and faith, authority and liberty of conscience, science and belief. If science be the sun, belief is the moon, a reflection of day amidst night. Faith is the supplement of reason in the darkness left by science before and behind it. It emanates from reason but can neither be confounded therewith nor bring it to confusion. The trespasses of reason upon faith or of faith upon reason are eclipses of sun or moon. When they come about, both source and reflector of light are rendered useless. Science perishes on account of systems which are no other than beliefs and faith succumbs to reason. In order to sustain the edifice, the two pillars of the temple must be parallel and separate. When they are brought by force together, as Samson brought them, they are thrown down, and the whole building collapses on the blind zealot or revolutionary, whose personal or national resentment has destined him beforehand to death. The struggles between the spiritual and temporal powers at all periods of humanity have been quarrels over domestic management. The papacy has been a jealous mother, seeking to supplant a husband in the temporal power, and she has lost the confidence of her children, 
while the temporal power in its usurpation of the priesthood is not less ridiculous than a man who should pretend to know better than a mother how to manage the home and nursery. The English, for example, from the moral and religious point of view, are like children swaddled by men, as we may appreciate by their spleen and dullness. If religious doctrine is comparable to a nurse's story, on the understanding that it is ingenious and beneficial morally, it is perfectly true for the child, and the father would be very foolish to contradict it. Give therefore to mothers a monopoly in tales of fairy, in songs and household solicitudes. Maternity is a type of the priesthoods, and it is because the church must be a mother only that the Catholic priest renounces the right of man and transfers in advance to herself his claim on fatherhood. It must never be forgotten that the papacy is either nothing or that it is the universal mother. It may be even that Pope Joan, out of which Protestants have constructed a tale of scandal, is only an ingenious allegory, and when sovereign pontiffs have ill-used emperors and kings, it has been Pope Joan trying to beat her husband, to the great scandal of the Christian world. So also schisms and heresies have been other conjugal quarrels, the Church and Protestantism speak evil one of another, lament one another, make a show of avoiding and being weary one of another, like spouses living apart. It is by the Kabbalah, and this alone, that all is explained and reconciled. All other doctrines are vivified and made fruitful thereby, it destroys nothing but, on on the contrary, gives reason to all that is. So all the forces of the world are at the service of this one and supreme science, while the true Kabbalist can make use at his pleasure, without hypocrisy and without falsehood, of the science possessed by the wise and the zeal of believers. He is more Catholic than M. de Maester, more Protestant than Luther, more Jewish than the chief rabbi, and a prophet more than Mohammed. Is he not above systems and the passions which darken truth? Can he not at will bring together their scattered rays, so variously reflected in all the fragments of that broken mirror which is universal faith, fragments which are taken by men for so many opposite beliefs? There is one being, one law and one faith, as there is only one race of man, Ihye Asher Ihye. On such intellectual and moral heights it will be understood that the human mind and heart enter into the deep peace. Peace profound. My brethren, such was the master word of high-grade masonry, being the association of Kabbalistic initiates. The war which the Church has been forced to make against magic was necessitated by the profanations of false Gnostics, but the true science of the Magi is Catholic essentially, basing all its realization on the hierarchic principle. Now, the only serious and absolute hierarchy is found in the Catholic Church, and hence true adepts have always shown for it the deepest respect and obedience. Henry Cunrath alone was a resolute Protestant, but in this he was a German of his period rather than a mystic citizen of the Eternal Kingdom. The essence of anti-Christianity is exclusion and heresy, it is the partition of the body of Christ, according to the beautiful expression of St. John, Omnis Spiritus Cut Solvit Christum Hic Antichristus Est. The reason is that religion is charity and that there is no charity in anarchy. Magic had also its anarchists, its makers and adherents of sects, its thaumaturgists and sorcerers. Our design is to vindicate the legality of the science from the usurpations of ignorance, fraud and folly, it is in this respect more especially that our work will stand to be useful, as it will be also entirely new. So far the history of magic has been presented as annals of a thing prejudged, or as chronicles, less or more exact, of a sequence in phenomena, seeing that no one believed that magic belonged to science. A serious account of this science in its rediscovery, so to speak, must set forth its developments or progress. We are walking in open sanctuary instead of among ruins, and we find that the holy places, so long buried under the debris of four civilizations, have been preserved more wonderfully than the mummified cities which excavation has unearthed, in all their dead beauty and desolate majesty, beneath the lava of Vesuvius. Bossuet in his magnificent work has shown us religion bound up everywhere with history, but what would he have said had he known that a science which, in a sense, was born with the world, provides an explanation of primeval dogmas, belonging to the one and universal religion, in virtue of their combination with the most incontestable theorems of mathematics and reason. Dogmatic magic is the key of all secrets as yet unfathomed by the philosophy of history, 
while practical magic alone opens the secret temple of nature to that power of human will which is ever limited, yet ever progressive. We are far from any impious pretense of explaining the mysteries of religion by means of magic, but our intention is to indicate after what manner science is compelled to accept and revere those mysteries. It shall be said no longer that reason must humble itself in the presence of faith, on the contrary, it must do honor to itself by believing, since it is faith which saves reason from the horrors of the void on the brink of the abyss, and it is its bond of union with the infinite. Orthodoxy in religion is respect for the hierarchy as the sole guardian of unity. Let us therefore not fear to repeat that magic is essentially the science of the hierarchy, remembering clearly that, before all things else, it condemns anarchic doctrines, while it demonstrates, by the very laws of nature, that harmony is inseparable both from power and authority. The chief attraction of magic for the great number of curious persons is that they see therein an exceptional means for the satisfaction of their passions. The unbeliever's horizon is of the same order. The avaricious would deny that there is any secret of Hermes corresponding to the transmutation of metals, for otherwise they would buy it and so enjoy wealth. But they are fools who believe that such a secret is sold. Of what use would be money to those who could make gold? That is true, says the skeptic, but if you, Eliphaz Levi, possessed it, would you not be richer than we are, who has told you that I am poor? Have I asked for anything at your hands? Where is the sovereign in the world who can boast that he has acquired from me any secret of science? Where is the millionaire whom I have given reason to believe that I would set my fortune against his? When we look at earthly wealth from beneath it, we may yearn for it as the sovereign felicity, but it is despised when we consider it from above and when one realizes how little temptation there can be to recover that which has been dropped as if it were hot iron. But apart from this, a young man will exclaim that if magical secrets were true, he would attain them that he might be loved by all women. Nothing of the sort, a day will come, poor child, when it will be too much to be loved by one of them, for sensual desire is a dual orgy, the intoxication of which causes disgust to supervene quickly, after which anger and separation follow. There was once an old idiot who would have liked to have become a magician in order to upset the world. But if you were a magician, my hero, you would not be an imbecile, and before the tribunal of your conscience you would find no extenuating circumstances, did you become a criminal. The Epicurean, on his part, demands the recipes of magic, that he may enjoy for ever and suffer nothing at all. In this case the science itself intervenes and says, as religion also says, blessed are those who suffer. But that is the reason why the Epicurean has lost faith in religion. Blessed are those who mourn, but the Epicurean scoffs at the promise. Hear now what is said by experience and by reason. Sufferings test and awaken generous sentiments, pleasures promote and fortify base instincts. Sufferings arm against pleasure, enjoyment begets weakness in suffering, pleasure squanders, pain in garners. Pleasure is man's rock of peril, the pain of motherhood is woman's triumph. Pleasure fertilizes and conceives but pain brings forth. Woe to him who cannot and will not suffer, he shall be overwhelmed by pain. Nature drives unmercifully those who will not walk, we are cast into life as into an open sea, we must swim or drown. Such are the laws of nature, as taught by transcendent magic. And now reconsider whether one can become a magician in order to enjoy everything and suffer nothing. Yet the world will ask, in such case, what profits magic? What would the prophet Balaam have replied to his Shias had the patient brute asked him what profits intelligence? What would Hercules have answered to a pygmy if he had inquired what profits strength? We do not compare worldly people to pygmies and still less to Balaam's ass, it would be wanting in politeness and good taste. We say therefore, with all possible graciousness, to such brilliant and amiable people, that for them magic is absolutely useless, it being understood further that they will never take it seriously. Our work is addressed to souls that toil and think. They will find an explanation therein of whatsoever has remained obscure in our doctrine and ritual. On the pattern of the great masters, we have followed the rational order of sacred numbers in the plan and division of our works, for which reason this history of magic is arranged in seven books, 
having seven chapters in each. The first book is dedicated to the sources of magic, it is the genesis of that science, and we have provided it with a key in the letter Aleph expressing Kabbalistically the original and primal unity. The second book contains historical and social formulae of the magical word in antiquity, its seal is the letter Beth, symbolizing the duad as an expression of the word which realizes, the special character of the gnosis and occultism. The third book is concerned with the realizations of antique science in Christian society. It shews after what manner, even for science itself, the word takes flesh. The number three is that of generation, of realization, and the key of this book is the letter Gimel, a hieroglyph of birth. We are introduced in the fourth book to the civilizing power of magic among barbarous races, to the natural productions of this science amidst peoples still in their childhood, to the mysteries of druids and their miracles, to the legends of bards, and it is shown after what manner these things concurred in the formation of modern societies, thus preparing a brilliant and permanent victory for Christianity. The number four expresses nature and force, while the letter Daleth, which stands for it in the Hebrew alphabet, is represented in that of the Kabbalists by an emperor on his throne. The fifth book is consecrated to the sacerdotal era of the Middle Ages, and we are present at the dissensions and struggles of science, the formation of secret societies, their unknown achievements, the secret rites of grimoires, the mysteries of the divine comedy, the divisions within the sanctuary which must lead later on to a glorious unity. The number five is that of the quintessence, religion and the priesthood, its character is the letter He, represented in the magical alphabet by the symbol of a high priest. The sixth book exhibits the intervention of magic in the work of the revolution. The number six is that of antagonism and strife in preparation for universal synthesis, and the corresponding letter is Vav, symbol of the creative lingam and the reaper's sickle. The seventh book is synthetic, containing an exposition of modern workings and discoveries, new theories on light and magnetism, the revelation of the great Rosicrucian secret, the explanation of mysterious alphabets, the science of the word and its magical works, in fine, the summary of the science itself, including an appreciation of what has been accomplished by contemporaneous mystics. This book is the complement and the crown of the work, as the septenary is the crown of numbers, uniting the triangle of idea to the square of form. Its corresponding letter is Zayn, and the Kabbalistic hieroglyphic is a victor mounted on a chariot, drawn by two sphinxes. Far from us be the ridiculous vanity of posing as a Kabbalistic victor, it is the science alone which should triumph, and that which we expose before the intelligent world, mounted on the cubic chariot and drawn by sphinxes, is the word of light, the divine fulfiller of the Mosaic Kabbalah, the human son of the Gospel, that man-God who has come once as Saviour and will manifest soon as Messiah, that is, as definitive and absolute king of temporal institutions. It is this thought which animates our courage and sustains our hope. But now it remains to submit all our conceptions, all our discoveries and all our labors to the infallible judgment of the hierarchy. To the authorized men of science be that which belongs to science. But the things which connect with religion are set apart to the church alone and to that one hierarchic church, the preserver of unity, which has been Catholic, Apostolic and Roman from the days of Christ Jesus to our own. To scholars our discoveries, to bishops our aspirations and beliefs. Woe to the child who believes himself wiser than his parents, to the man who acknowledges no masters, to that dreamer who thinks and prays by himself. Life is an universal communion and in such communion do we find immortality. He who isolates himself is given over to death thereby and an eternity of isolation would be eternal death. Eliphaz Levi Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment and share.